What's up, my healthy friends? It's you, it's me, and it's Karen, and we're all hanging out here together to be more healthy and more abundantly amazing together, which is something that I'm tangibly working on with you in 2023 because it's my mission to coach 500 people to stop the binge eating and savage self-talk cycle so they can lose weight whilst feeling in control and without restriction along the way. And if that's something you want to do and something you want to work on in regards to your emotional binge or overeating, then this is the sign you've been waiting for. It's time. Getting involved is super easy. Just scroll down to the show notes below, send me a message, and we'll have a bit of a DNM chat about getting you started on one of our coaching programs. So simply scroll down to the show notes below, click the link, and send me a message, and you will be on your way. So here we have Karen Martell, who first appeared on episode 133 of this show, which feels like so long ago. What is Karen all about? Well, apart from being one of my most hilariously fun friends, she's also a certified hormone specialist, transformational nutrition coach, and women's weight loss expert. She's the founder of the revolutionary program called On Track, which is a women's hormone balancing and weight loss program. And she's also host of the top rated women's health podcast, which I've been lucky enough to be on a few times called The Other Side of Weight Loss. After struggling with her own health issues, Karen's passion lies in helping women break through weight loss resistance to find their own personal weight loss code through diet variation and hormone optimization. Karen, welcome back to the show. What in the world is going on? (laughs) (laughs) So happy that you had me back on your show. I've had you on several times and I'm going to have you on again. So I'm happy to be here. Uh, Anytime to talk to you. Yeah, likewise. Well, and I mean, we hang out most weeks. So we do. How did it take us so long to actually record a conversation? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Maddie and I, we get to see each other every week, but we've never actually seen each other's legs. We've only ever seen each other from the chest up. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a running joke that are some of our closest friends in the world, we've never actually seen their legs before. <laughs> totally. But we were just discussing the possibility in a couple of months of that happening. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to make it happen. Maddie just told me that he is coming through Canada and it just happens to be the one week that Karen is out of the country, which I have not left the country for five years. So (laughs) this to be happening is like, are you kidding me? So you've got to stay until I get back and then we'll make it happen. Yeah, we have to make it happen. So I can see your legs. (laughs) Yes. Look, and I'll do a lot of work on my legs. I'll do, you know, deadlifts and all sorts of different things. So the legs are worth looking at. Super shapely legs for me to see. (laughs) Yes, yes. Um, So what has been going on in the world of menopause and perimenopause? Because I know that that's your space. um, And I know through lots of conversations as we've had over the last few years about where you're spending your energy and time that a lot has been going on. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's, yeah, I'm, I feel like I'm on this like mission these last couple of years to really get the word out there about perimenopause and menopause and what happens to us women. Because unfortunately, we are not getting this information out there. We're, you know, we tend to go to our doctors, right? We, you know, something starts to go wrong in our body and we think maybe it's our hormones and we, you know, do a quick Google search and then we think, okay, I better go to my doctor because X, Y, Z is happening. And I just read a statistic that 7% of medical doctors are trained in menopause. And then quite shortly afterwards, I read 0% are right. trained in menopause and 0% are trained in perimenopause. And I've spoken even to one of the doctors that I work with. And he said, Karen, I was never taught anything in menopause when I went to school. And he's like, I remember a teacher asking me, who's going to go into menopausal care, raise your hand. And he said, not one person raised their hand. So the, doc- the, the teacher said, okay, let's move on. So that's how much wow. our doctors know. And yet that's who that's the only place that we know of to go to get that information. And so I'm really trying to change that and really trying to educate women on what their options are to when they're going through this time because unfortunately 85% of women are going to experience symptoms in this time. 
And we can talk about what that looks like. But 25%, Maddie, are going to get severe symptoms. And I've heard of women that have wanted to commit suicide, that were getting divorces because of their menopause symptoms. Um, women that have had to leave their jobs, it's actually a very common thing to happen in the business world where, you know, these women are have these, you know, high stress jobs, they start to go through perimenopause and menopause, and they get a lot of symptoms so badly that they actually have to leave their job. And that that's so uncalled for. Mm. And it's, and it's ridiculous. And I, and I always say, if this was a man's problem, and no offense to you, but if this was a man's problem, this wouldn't be happening. And that's just the truth of the matter. Yeah. I guess based on, you just mentioned all of the symptoms and that, you know, there's a lot of women that experience it at a really severe and high level to the point they leave the jobs. Um, what, wh- when do they begin and what do menopause symptoms look like? Because I think as well in the age of, you know, the modern super busy woman that's got kids and got a career and got everything going on, that it's not, just the day that menopause starts, they're already experiencing a lot of hormone problems because they're driving themselves into the ground with stress. So how does one distinguish when menopause begins and what that actually looks like? Yeah, we're starting to see perimenopause actually happening earlier than it ever has in history from um, you know, you'll go into Google and you'll say, well, when does perimenopause hit? And it'll say, oh, you know, average of two to three years from, you know, the age 48 to 52, let's say, or 48 to 50, whatever it is. And then menopause hits at 52. This is not the case anymore. We are now seeing women starting perimenopause around the age of 35 to 40. That is the most common age for women to start losing certain hormones. And that's what is perimenopause is the definition is the years leading up to losing your period. And menopause is technically one day. And that one day is the first day after 12 months of not having a period. And then after that, you are considered postmenopause, And that number, they just kind of like drew it out of nowhere. There's no rhyme or reason to why it's got to be 12 months. So, you know, if a woman gets to 11 months and she gets a period, she's got to start all counting all over again, which is just, yeah, ridiculous. So we start to see women in their late 30s typically start gaining a little bit of weight, which is the first thing that seems to happen that they, that they of course notice, right. They don't change anything. And they're like, Oh, wait a second. I just put five pounds on what's going on. The next thing that'll start to happen is heavier periods. So we'll start to see women, you know, they'll say things like, Oh, I'm like, I'm bleeding out. You know, I can go through a tampon every five minutes. I'm like, what's going on? That's when they'll usually head to the doctors because that's the scary thing. And you feel like, you know, you're having these super, super heavy periods that are really cramping and bad PMS. And, and then the doctor would typically at that point say, well, if you're done having kids, you know, maybe we should just pull her all out. Let's have a hysterectomy. Hysterectomies are the second most performed surgery on women in the United States. I didn't know that. Yeah. And it's, you know, they'll say things like, oh, well, you don't need it. You don't hit, you're not, you're done having kids. We'll leave the ovaries. Well, we know that the uterus is actually there for a reason. Go figure, not just about having children. (laughs) Nature doesn't make mistakes. (laughs) Exactly. It's there to like hold up your intestines. It's there to hold place your bladder. So without it, things can start to fall and prolapse. So it's there for a reason. We also now know that there is a uterus brain connection, very similar to the whole, you know, gut brain connection that we're hearing so much about. Now they're, they've discovered there's also a uterus brain connection. And research has shown that women without their uterus actually have a higher risk of short term memory loss and dementia. Interesting. So it's, it's very important. We don't want to just rip it out. And once again, when I always say like, if this was a guy's problem, you know, and if a guy came in and had something wrong with his penis and his scrotum, let's say, would we ever say, well, let's just get rid of your balls. You're having, you're not, you're not having children anymore. Right. So let's just take them out. (laughs) It just wouldn't happen. But it's, that's exactly the same thing. It's just, we're just saying, who cares? Let's just take this organ out of your body. 
And most women will say, heck yes, let's do it because they don't want to bleed anymore. They don't want to have those symptoms, but that's not getting to the root of the problem. Having a uterus is not why that's happening. It's because you're losing a very important hormone called progesterone. And progesterone is made when you ovulate. And as we age, as we all know, we don't ovulate as often. That's why we're told to have children when we're in our 20s and 30s. Because as you get older, the less eggs you have, the less chance you have of getting pregnant. So if you don't ovulate, you don't produce progesterone in the second half of your cycle. So now we have then estrogen, which is a growth hormone being produced all month long. And progesterone is supposed to step in at about day 14 and counterbalance that growth. Stop it from going out of control. It also stops it from even getting like tender breasts because that's kind of a growth thing too, or fibrocystic breasts, fibroids, ovarian cysts, endometriosis. This is growth, growth, growth from, that's driven by estrogen. So progesterone is like the yang to the yang of the estrogen. They need each other. And so women are typically A, given the hysterectomy, or they're given a birth control pill that has synthetic progesterone in it. And we know that synthetic progesterone, which is also in birth control pills, increases your risk of breast cancer, increases your risk of clots, increases your risk of leaky gut. Um, It can shrink your brain. I mean, the list goes on. When we could be giving these women what they're missing, which is bioidentical progesterone, which is the exact same thing that the body makes. There's no difference. And so there's so much misinformation about that, that women aren't being given that option. Yes. And instead they're being given these other options. Yeah. Before I dive into all of the hormone uh, and uh, HRT and bioidentical bioident- hormones and stuff. I just want to ask, because I get asked this question myself, is that people, as you mentioned, they acknowledge that weight loss starts to happen and that when they've changed nothing, which is a sign that, yes, that hormone change and that menopausal change is beginning. Um, how much weight approximately is is menopause weight and how much weight is food weight? Because we get you know, this variation or this experience with people where they're like, I haven't changed anything or maybe, you know, the eating, the terrible eating that I've been doing for years has finally caught up with me. How do I distinguish what is a healthy menopausal weight gain versus I need to do something about this that's outside of menopause? Yeah, that's tough because there's two things that start to happen because without that progesterone, and then we become estrogen dominant, which makes us gain weight. But at the same time, progesterone also is in charge of helping us to relax. It's very anti-anxiety. It helps us to sleep. Sorry. (laughs) Helps us to sleep. So we know that if you don't sleep and you've got anxiety, guess what? You're going to start eating more. It also helps us to become more insulin sensitive. So without these things, you're, you will be driven to eat more, which will then contribute to the weight gain. But if a woman's like, I know for a fact, like I'm tracking my calories, I am not eating any more than I ever have, and I'm exercising the same amount, and I've suddenly put on five pounds, 10 pounds, whatever it is, then, and, and she's got some of those other symptoms happening, like bad PMS, maybe some insomnia, some, um, you know, the fibrocystic breast, things like that, the heavy bleeding. Then you could be like, okay, for sure, it's probably hormonal. Um, as we get into our 40s and we start to lose estrogen, that is actually what drives our weight gain more than any of the other hormones, the loss of it. And most women think that estrogen just is going to make them fat. Um, because everyone thinks they're estrogen dominant. But estrogen, yes, too much can make you gain weight, like any hormone, but too little will really, really drive weight gain, especially in the abdomen. And, and why so is that? We see, I, there's, they're not 100% sure, partly because estrogen is really tied in with insulin. So without it, we become a lot more insulin resistant. And if you look at people with type 2 diabetes, what's the typical look? A, be- a belly. Yeah. Right. So they usually have, they carry all their weight in their midsection. 
visceral fat. So there's that. And then estrogen, I think that this is estrogen. Our bodies are just really smart. We need estrogen. It's the most vital hormone for a woman. So as we start to lose one of the estrogens, which is called estradiol from our ovaries, then we can still make an estrogen called estrone, but that's made from our fat tissue. So I think, and there's no, I don't, haven't been able to find evidence to support this, but (laughs) that your body goes, we need some estradiol. So let's put some fat on you so we can convert some of like NACAR estrone from your fat and that can convert down into estradiol. So it's kind of like so, one power plant has gone offline, so we need to build another one. 100%. Yes. It's like your body goes, okay, we need some estrogen here. So there's a few different things that are happening. There's some research that also shows another hormone that's a brain hormone called follicular stimulating hormone. They see that when it goes up, with the as estrogen goes down, follicular stimulating hormone goes up because it's trying to tell your ovaries to make estrogen. We know that when it gets to above 20, that we see the weight gain happening then. So like a a big, a surge of it. And women can gain anywhere from 10 to 30 pounds in menopause without changing much. Yeah, gotcha. That must be so uncomfortable and annoying. No wonder people are like, just give me a hysterectomy, solve the problem, get it done, like get rid of it. I'm sick of this. damn body that's taking me on this roller coaster of a lifetime. <laughs> yeah, and what are you what are we being told? Eat less, move more. Like the same old crap that we've always heard, which it just doesn't apply to us. It does in a sense that yeah, we really have to freaking watch what we eat as we go through this midlife time because our body is going to be so susceptible to weight gain more than it ever has been. But you got to put all these other things in place like stress management, sleep, you got to replace the hormones, you got to find the diet that's going to work for you and you got to get control of all these things. We know that hormones drive our eating behavior. Even so, a lot of women are like, "Why is it that I can't stop eating? Why am? Why is it that I'm so like I can't stop eating the sugar?" And then we try, okay, well, what's the root of the problem? And I, hundred percent, we need to look at all that stuff and like, what are what's what are the emotions driving these things? But at the same time, we're leaving this huge piece of that puzzle um, unexplored, which is estrogen helps us to make serotonin. Yeah. So without estrogen, we get depressed. Without the progesterone, we get anxiety. So what? those are the two emotions that drive eating behavior more than anything else, right? That yeah. we, like nobody wants to eat freaking broccoli and chicken if they're depressed or have anxiety. Totally. We just want to eat sugar. So women beat themselves up because they feel like they can't control this and that there's something wrong with them and they have no willpower. And it's like, how about we give back the body what it's missing so that you can have more control over your eating behavior. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Something that popped up in my thoughts just as you were talking then and sort of thinking about, the, say, the last 100 years of social progress for women particularly is that, you know, women have obviously done menopause, which is not, you know, a disease. It's a, it's a natural part of the yes. life cycle um, for, what, a million years, a couple hundred thousand yep. years. And in the last you know, 100,000 years, at least from my understanding, there's been a massive jump in the the workload of your average woman um, in regards to once upon a time, most women, uh, you know, sort of stayed at home, looked after the kids and did the whole housewife thing. Um, and I'm not saying I have any opinions on this. I'm just acknowledging that adding in a full-time career to that is, you know, a lot of stress. And so I'm wondering, how do you think the modern person experiences menopause compared to a woman, say, 500 years ago, 10,000 years ago. Like, surely, you know, we couldn't do hysterectomies 10,000 years ago or whatever it might have been. And, and I'm guessing that possibly it wasn't such a devastating experience because we lived very different lives. Well, average age for women of, the, of death was around 40. Mm-hmm. So we would basically, as soon as we started to hit that perimenopausal menopausal time between 40 and 50 is typically when we would die. Mm -hmm. So never before have we lived this long. So this is a whole new thing, right? Like we're, the whole world has become anti-aging. 
right? We have surgeries and the, the drugs and all of these things that are keeping us alive longer and longer and longer. So we have to move with the times with that. It's like, yes, menopause is natural. And a lot of women will say, well, I don't want to use hormones because this is natural. I'm supposed to go through menopause. And yes, you are supposed to go through menopause, but like you said, nothing in this environment is anything like it was 10,000 years ago. We're not dealing with the same stuff. Our endocrine, like the endocrine disruptors that are now in our environment are taking a massive toll on us. This is why we're seeing women go into early menopause, why we're having so much infertility, why we're having so many just health problems. And it's all driven by these endocrine disruptors that are in our environment. So we're getting bombarded. And sure, we can say, you know, no, I want to do this naturally. This is part of this is how I'm supposed to age, et cetera, et cetera. But are you going to say that if let's say you develop heart disease, you're let's say you're 70, you've got heart disease, you need heart surgery or heart medication. Are you then going to say, yeah, no, I am going to, I am going to age naturally. This is part of aging. This has happened to me because I'm getting old. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say no to that medication. We wouldn't, we would never say that. We would never say that to the diabetic that needs insulin. These hormones are not just about pro procreating. These hormones are life hormones. These can help ward off all disease. So we have to look at it as a, 2023 problem, which is we've got a lot coming at us. We need help mm -hmm. and we have access to it and we're living longer than ever. And we can live really good quality lives if we pay attention to these hormones as we age. So, yeah, I, and I do think too, Maddie, you're right. Like as women, I will say like, I'm such a feminist, but I will say we've shot ourselves in the foot. Like we did go from, you know, being at home with the children, manning the house, which is a full-time job yeah. to, you know, trying, you know, so hard for equality, but now we're, it's like, we're doing it all. Now we're raising the children, manning the house, cooking, cleaning, and running and doing a full-time job. Not to say that husbands don't part part partake in all of this, but I do tend to see women still doing the majority of a lot, a lot of those jobs of child rearing and, and it's a lot, it's just a lot. It's yeah. kids should really have a full-time parent at home, even though I'm not, yeah, I, I've, you know, I'm, I'm a businesswoman, but I know that my, some, some things with my children have suffered because I've chosen to also have a career. And I think every woman that does both can honestly say the same thing and same with a father, right? Mm -hmm. It's no different. It, you it's a lot. It's a lot of stress. We're running our kids around to have sports and all these things after school events. And then plus we're working all day. We're not sleeping. We're eating like crap. We're staring at our TVs. We're it's, it's a lot for the system. And we know that stress more than anything else can really dictate how a woman will go through perimenopause and menopause and how much she'll suffer. Well, I think that's one of the things with what you're talking about in regards to women being so busy and having such a massive workload. And I think, and funnily enough, I had a little debate with a friend of mine the other night um, and who is a, a woman, um, which is uh, the fact that, you know, women, they need a bit more nurture because you have a monthly cycle for a significant portion of your month. And those, you know, those uh, hormones that fluctuate up and down are not always in a state to be super hyper productive. Um, yeah. and men are lucky enough that we have the ability to do that on a daily basis. And that's not me saying that women don't deserve to be just like men. Sure. But the consequence, there's, there's consequences if we don't actually have a nurture phase of that monthly cycle whilst you are cycling. Oh, a hundred percent. Like the world is built around a man's clock, not a woman's clock. Yeah. And, and it, we need to find that balance in both because you're right. Like there's times of the month where we're on fire and we've got lots of estrogen and testosterone and we're ready to roll, you know, physically, mentally, everything. <laughs> we want to be more social. We want more sex. We're like, I want to do a good workout. I can eat really well. 
And then second half of the month hits, progesterone steps in, which is calming, makes you a little more mellow, gets you more introverted, sex drive goes down, communication goes down. And that's when we need to take care of ourselves a little bit more and not like push it at the gym and start dieting and starving ourselves, (laughs) like all those terrible things that we do to ourselves. We really need to pay attention to that that rhythm that we have as women. And it's a month to month thing. And it's, it's absolutely ignored. And it's really too bad. Yeah, I agree. I like too, that you said, um, you know, that in 2023, and in this modern era that we're in, we have to acknowledge the level of toxicity that we're exposed to. So it's kind of, you Mm -hmm. know, if you if you choose the natural path, just for your menopause and ignore the rest of your life, then you're sort of yeah, you're out of balance anyway. It's like, unless you choose the natural menopause path, move to the middle of nowhere, don't eat anything out of plastic ever again, (laughs) never eat sugar. Like, unless you do all of it, you're still going to have some kind of uncomfortable experience because there's something or many things throwing the system out of whack. Yes, exactly. And and then also there's a lot to do with genetics too, um, where... You know, some women, the way their genetics are and the certain um, SNPs that they have can make them very sensitive to hormonal loss. Like, I'll talk to some women, they're like, oh, I had a hot flash once. I didn't gain any (laughs) weight. I'm like... Yeah, you can imagine what I want to say to those women. (laughs) I personally, at 42, started to go into menopause, which is really early. And I had thought in my head leading up to then, like, Oh, I'll be fine. I'm a nutritionist. I'm so healthy. I've been, I don't drink. I, you know, I eat super well. I don't have sugar addiction. I'm doing all the right things. And then at 42, I had every bloody symptom a woman could have. It was horrible. I was night sweating all night. I couldn't sleep. My sex drive, like, hello, like where, what sex drive? Like there was none. It, everything that could happen to me, it happened. And I was a hot mess. And I was like, how is this that uh, this is happening to me? And at 42. And as I, I went and I got, I did some DNA testing and I discovered that I'm very estrogenic. And if you just looked at my body, you could see I'm very estrogenic. I've got the hips. I've got, you know, the curves. I'm very prone to weight gain. And then there's my sister, who is a great example of who's really androgenic for a woman. She's straight up and down, no hips, no breasts, no butt. She's really wiry, has can eat whatever she wants, whenever she wants, and will not gain a single pound. And so when I lost my estrogen, I was super sensitive to that. Because I am very estrogenic. So I depend on that estrogen for my well being. And somebody like my sister, she, if her testosterone goes down, she will notice it more than I would if my testosterone went down. So DNA has something to do with it. And so does genetics just coming from your parents, like your mother? How did your mother go through menopause? Um, What kind of toxic load did she have? We know that things like mercury fillings will be passed on in utero to the baby. So that can really mess up a woman's hormones as she ages. So all of these things come into play and it, and this is an issue of the modern world. This is what's happening. And so we have to come at this from multiple different areas. We have to detox. We have to replace the hormones. We have to supplement. We have to eat well and, and eat whole foods and find what diet's going to work for us, not what's just on the market right now mm-hmm. that's hot. <laughs> we, have to, we have to do all of these things. We have to watch our stress. We have to sleep. We have, you know, has to be part of this time for a woman if she really just wants to thrive during her midlife. And it doesn't have to be bad. Like I'm talking all these bad things, but this is also a time in a woman's life where it's all finally about her. Like we're talking about, oh, you women, we, we tend to be the nurturers, be the ones that, you know, we want the children, we want to raise the kids in most cases. And finally, when we get to this stage, our kids have grown up, you know, we've, we're settled into our marriage and our jobs at this point. So we can finally focus on what we want. But if you're suffering, 
and you can, this can go on for 10, 12 years. Like I'm not talking, it's not an average of two to three years. It's an average of eight years that women will go through perimenopause and feel that. So eight years of your life, it can be the best time of your life or it can be the worst. And so we really have to start manning our hormones um, during this time. I think for any practitioners that are listening, they'll relate to what you said before. Any practitioners or people that consider themselves like health experts in the field is those moments where you, you describe for you where you feel like an absolute imposter or like you're a total fraud because you're like, this is my area or this is my knowledge and I have had it too when I find myself yeah. with a cookie in my hand or if like, you know, I'm <laughs> out with friends and we're eating pizza. I'm like, oh my God, I'm... I'm I'm totally not doing this correctly. If somebody Hopefully sees nobody me, nobody sees me. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then I'm like, no, no, I'm a human too. And so I think a lot of people can relate to those moments where they're like, shit, I thought I had it all all together and right, and how could this be happening? <laughs> yes, I did reverse it all. So exactly. So for five years, I've reversed all of those problems. But yes, it, it it was embarrassing. I gained a lot of weight. Mm-hmm. I put on 15 pounds, and it was like oh my gosh, here I am a weight loss coach. And I just packed on 15 pounds in a couple of months. And it was literally a couple of months. So it was devastating for me. It was a very, very hard time. But looking back, I know why it happened, of course, because I wouldn't have dug into hormones like I did um, if I hadn't had that happen to me because I needed to find out everything that was going on. And so I just went on a like, crazy mission of reading everything I could get my hands on about the w- women's hormonal system. Yeah. Well, let's go into that. Like what, what are mm-hmm. the options now? Cause you mentioned, you know, uh, bioidentical hormones and many people know, you know, ha- understand HRT um, or at least I've heard their doctor talk about them possibly cause not all doctors are into them. Um, Probably not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. What are the options? Where should people go? What should they do when things begin to get or feel like they're getting out of hand? Yeah. So I say in perimenopause, you know, if you're between the ages of 35 and 40 and you're starting to get some of the symptoms that I was talking about, there's a lot you can do without jumping to hormones. You know, we can take things like Vitex, vitamin C. Both of those are really great for producing progesterone. So managing stress. Great. Managing stress is going to help us to make our other sex hormones. So All of these things, you know, you can supplement, you can diet, you can make sure you're eating really clean, meditation, yoga, all of those things that you guys all know about that you probably are like, I'm just saying this to deaf on on deaf ears, falling on deaf ears, because people just don't want to hear that anymore. They want like some magical, like, you know, like, Ooh, this is the solution that I've never heard of before. The secret potion. You and I have talked about this before on our podcast where, it's like people, it just, it comes down to, we know what to do. And we, all of these things, these foundational pieces mm-hmm. really do make a huge difference, but most people ignore them. So I will they're say right simple. now that it, they're too simple. They're not exciting enough. It's like, oh, what? I have to just eat well. well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How boring. How boring. Can't I just like <laughs> take this magic pill? But anyways, So there's lots that you can do in that time period before jumping to hormones. But at the same time, it's also very safe to jump to hormones. If you're done having children and your progesterone is low and you know that you're not ovulating as often because you're getting these heavy periods and you've gained some weight, then starting progesterone is not going to be bad for you. It's just giving back the body what it needs. And so Putting that back in is is totally okay. It's not going to suppress your own production of progesterone either. It's not going to suppress your ovulation. So having that as a tool can be really helpful um, just to, you know, put it on the second half of your cycle when you would normally produce it. And it can just, I've had women that'll contact me like literally the day later and be like, could I seriously be feeling it that fast? I'm like, yes, you can. That's how fast you can feel it because it just feels so good. It's like, oh, I feel so much more relaxed. I'm not such a bitch anymore. Like, <laughs> right? I, I have women say that all the time because it's very relaxing. It really helps with PMS. 
Um, I, I, even for myself, I started progesterone after I had my son at 37 and I just couldn't lose the last 10 pounds. Like no matter what I did, I was like doing everything right, trying every diet under the sun. And I was finally like a year after he was born, I still had that 10 pounds. And I was like, I'm going to go test my hormones, go test my hormones. Sure enough, I have no progesterone so low. So I started progesterone cream one month. I lost the 10 pounds. Wow. One month. So it was like uh, both sisters too. They had both had really bad postpartum depression. They couldn't stop crying. And when they started progesterone cream, it instantly went away. Yeah, that's impressive. And, and one sister was suicidal. Like she was, it was really, really, really bad. So, and she said within like 48 hours, she was back. To, she felt normal again. Yeah, that's incredible. So, very, yeah. So you can use it then. As we start going through our 40s, this is when estrogen, progesterone will drop by about 75%. Estrogen will kind of go on this wild ride where it's going to go up some months and then it's going to come down. So you'll have months where you're going to get estrogen deficiency symptoms, which are uh, low sex drive, foggy brain, dry skin, dry eyes, um, hair loss can be something. Oh, what else? Depression, insulin resistance. So you want to eat more. Um, oh, the list goes on for estrogen. It can it can affect so every organ in your body can be affected by the loss of estrogen. So thyroid can start to go down because of both the loss of estrogen and progesterone. Um, so you'll see the weight gain happening. Um, it's in, in really important for lubrication and of everything, not just the vagina, everything. Like, so people will start to, women will say they'll start to get really sore joints right. and be really stiff when they wake up. Um, saggy skin, wrinkles, because it has, estrogen helps us to actually make collagen. So these things can start happening and then you'll have months where you're going to be kind of in that estrogen dominant phase where you're going to be bleeding really heavy and then you're going to miss a period. So during this time, you can take phytoestrogens, which are excellent. So you can eat things like flaxseed and um, some soy products. I'm not a big fan of soy, but if it's fermented organic soy, like tofu, that can be okay. Um, Things like uh, black cohosh, sage, dong quay. These are all supplements that can really, really help to level out those hormones. And that's what I did when I started to go into menopause at 42. I just took a menopause supplement and it helped immensely, like immensely. And I did that for about a year with my progesterone. And then I, I, it, things got, kind of took a turn again. So then I started to, to put on estrogen cream. And a lot of doctors won't give women estrogen until they're in menopause, which is really sad because they demonize estrogen. Everybody thinks it's going to give them breast cancer because of the Women's Health Initiative study. And that has been fully debunked. Like it, it was read completely wrong. There's been several um, reanalysis of it done. So we know that Actually, the arm of the study where the women were only using estrogen had a decrease by 31% in developing breast cancer. And it was the arm of the study where women were using both estro both the horse's estrogen and fake progestin that had the increase of breast cancer. And so we know it's the progestin, which is also in birth control, that gives women the increase of breast cancer. We know that women that replace their estrogen have a, a, a overall, when we look at all the studies, they actually have a reduced risk of developing all cancer, including breast cancer, but all cancers by 33%. So to, to not give it to a woman when she's suffering from her estrogen loss is, is really terrible. Yeah. Um, it's just, it makes no sense to me, but doctors will say, oh, I can't give you estrogen. It's going to give you cancer. Well, we know it actually helps to prevent cancer. So if, you know, if you're suffering and the supplementation is not working, find somebody that is willing to work with you and what you're experiencing, because you could even look like you have pretty good levels on paper, on labs, but if you're an estrogenic person, a little drop can, can cause a lot of suffering. So having a little bit to, you know, to top your thing, to top your own levels up 
can make this ride a heck of a lot smoother. And I just don't believe we should be waiting for women to be 30 pounds overweight, a complete hot mess, like left her job, left her spouse. Okay, now I'll give you your estrogen back. That's just not fair. So yeah, we know no. that, like I say, like even just with sex drive alone, which is so important for relationships, my my podcast this month is actually all about sexual and vagina health. And we know that estrogen is almost more important for some women than testosterone for sex drive. So testosterone is really important for sex drive too. And we do see women losing that in their 40s as well, sometimes even in their 30s. So when we drop in testosterone, we'll gain weight because we lose muscle tissue, we lose our sex drive, and then the estrogen comes down, our vagina gets dry, we don't want to have sex. I've had women that said, I, I had a client recently and she said, I haven't had sex with my husband in two years because last time we had sex, it tore my vagina tissue. Wow. And it, she was traumatized by it. Of course. Well, fair enough. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Horrible. And I was like, and she said, you know, we used to have the best sex life. And I was like, that is hard. Like, it just gives me shivers to talk about. I was like, the fact that nobody has helped you, I said, that is so sad. Um, thankfully, she had a very supportive husband. But, you know, now her, well, I'll say, tell you, her vagina is very happy and lubricated and <laughs> <they're> having sex. <laughs> but that's because thanks to the estrogen, I had another woman contact me last week who said, Karen, you told me to put my estrogen on my labia. You didn't tell me, though, that it was going to increase my orgasms. I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Super important. So it's not just going to bring lubrication to the vagina. It's also going to help with orgasms mm -hmm. and pleasure. And I've heard, too, before that it's like testosterone makes you want to go out and get it, and estrogen makes you actually want to do it. And I do see that. I see that in when with women and when we start to replace their hormones and what that does for them um, sexually, it's, it's, it's amazing. We, no woman should have to deal with that. I think this is a fantastic marketing opportunity. What do you want? More <laughs> orgasms? Amazing. Come and see Karen. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> you want better orgasms, a lubricated <laughs> vagina? Come see me. <laughs> I've got a question though. Um, it, how long do people need to medicate? Is this something people need to do forever? Like, or is it well into their postmenopausal years? Uh, or uh, do they have to start weaning off it so that their body can sort of take back over? Like, where does where's the line for that kind of medication? So once the ovaries stop making estrogen, testosterone, and progesterone, our adrenal system can make some of those make those hormones just very small amounts. Mm -hmm. And because we are so stressed out, we typically don't make any yeah. from our adrenal system because our adrenal system will prioritize cortisol. So if you start to choose to replace the hormones, they typically, because they make you feel like yourself again and reverse all these horrible symptoms that can happen, most women actually choose to stay on them. And the the old the old theory was 10 years you had this 10 year window post menopause where it showed to be very beneficial in using hormones past the 10 years they saw an increased risk a small increased risk of heart attack and stroke that was with old hrt that was with which was premren which came from pregnant horses urine and the progestin now that we're using bioidentical transdermal hormones, estrogen, now menopause, the menopause society has just come out recently to say we, there is no cutoff. That it is totally okay for women to stay on hormones past 10 years post menopause. So, in my eyes, because our hormones help us to reverse age, it helps to keep our organs intact, right? Cholesterol will go up. You will develop osteoporosis if you don't replace estrogen. Um, we know that Alzheimer's and dementia, if we, there was a study that came out of Arizona um, in 2021, that 4,000 women, women that replaced their estrogen, estradiol for six years or longer, had a 75% reduction in developing Alzheimer's and dementia. It's amazing. 75. Yeah. Like, that's insane considering it's like an uncurable disease. So 
why would we want to stop them? That's my, that's, I mean, by all means, if somebody's like, you know, I've been on these hormones for 15 years, I'm, I'm going to come off and see what happens. Go for it. Um, personally, I plan to stay on them to the day I die. You talked before about like the HRT, some of the HRT stuff coming from like a horse, pregnant horse's urine. So what exactly is a bioidentical hormone? Like, where is that coming from and what exactly is it? Is it a synth- synthetic thing made in a lab? It's, a, it's made in a lab, but it comes from soy or yams. Mm-hmm. And it is exactly the same makeup as your own hormones. There's no difference. There was a massive difference between our estrogen, for instance, and a horse's estrogen. Horse has a lot more and they have a lot of estrone in them. So very, very different, even though it did help women. But bioidentical is exactly the same makeup as your own hormones. And it comes from plants, but it is made in a lab. Mm -hmm. And you just mentioned then too that it's soy. So I'm just sort of piecing some bits of this conversation together um, that it can come from soy. But also before you said you're not a fan of soy. Um, Yes. So just I'm just sort of picking up that thread in case people pick that up and are like, hang on, there's like two opinions here. Can you just like round out that conversation for us? So it, you're not rubbing soy on your body. So it's going to be chemically extracted out of soy. Soy is the number one most estrogenic food in the world. It's phytoestrogen plant. So it's going to be chemically removed from that. Same with the chemically removal of, you can actually get estrogen from yam too. So it can be brought, taken out of the yam, but you're not, it's not like you're rubbing yam in its whole state mm-hmm. on your, that, that doesn't work. So you're just taking a part, a piece of that. I don't know how it's done, but it's, it, they're taking a part of that or a chemical makeup of that somehow and putting it into a cream or a suppository or a gel. Yeah, so gotcha. It's, yeah, I have, I have to find that out because I actually had a woman yesterday say, I'm allergic to soy, so I don't think I can do estrogen. And I'm like, no, that's not a thing. That's not a problem because soy is one of the most highly allergic um, allergic food sensitivities in the world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I think this is really interesting that the idea that people can be, yeah, on them forever and they're going to have all of these benefits. Um, Like, yeah. Is there any type of, I guess, because alarm bells go off for me when I hear be on drugs forever. And that's part of the reason that that I left that I left the cancer hospital, right? Is that, um, you know, a lot of people can keep their cancer at bay by staying on drugs forever. Um, And so I kind of think, well, that's big pharma cashing in, but are we just going to get to a point where all women need to be on drugs for the rest of their life, you know, in a hundred years from now, just to maintain a state of living? Like, so I'm like, how, how else can we, you know, get them off after that 10 years or get them off, you know, into a, some kind of natural state, but maybe humans aren't moving towards anything that is natural. (laughs) Well, no, I, I hear you though. I, I, I felt the same way. Like it was a struggle for me because I'm such a natural person. Um, and I, in 100%, you will not have the same degree of symptoms in most cases, Mm -hmm. right? Like perimenopause with the fluctuations and the drop of hormones causes a lot of the symptoms. And then you'll hear women that are, you know, post-menopause saying that things have chilled. They don't, you know, I still have some women, I've had a 70 year woman that still gets hot flashes. No sex drive, that kind of thing, for sure. (laughs) Yeah. And that, yeah. So there's some that will carry on with the symptoms, but in most cases, a lot of those symptoms calm down, not the internal stuff though. The internal stuff will continue to age without the hormones, even with the hormones, you're still going to struggle, right? Because it's, they're not to the level that they were when you're in your twenties, but you know, think about it. Let me ask you this. So if you're 70 years old and you, your penis starts to shrivel up, you can't have sex anymore because the skin on it is so thin and dry that if you had sex, Maddie, it's going to tear. Then so, you don't want sex anyways because you have zero desire. Mm-hmm. You're fat. You've just gained weight out of, for no reason. You're depressed. You've got no energy. Your cholesterol's through the roof. You're, pre- you're pre-diabetic. 
your bones are going to hell. You've got no muscle tissue on you any, anymore. You're not happy. Are you going to say, you know, it, or if I came to you and I said, Maddie, uh, if I gave you your testosterone back, all of these problems could go away. What are you going to choose? Yeah, obviously the testosterone. And I just felt a compulsion to grab my junk. In yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be like, no, like, what are you oh doing? <laughs> yeah. No, no, don't say that. <laughs> but that's what, I mean, that's the, those are the symptoms of low testosterone in men. Yeah. Yeah. And it does happen to guys lose their testosterone and it's happening more and more so. Yeah. Um, because of the environment once again. So it's, and then what's the alternative? So we don't want to take drugs for the rest of our life, but if you don't replace that testosterone, you then could develop diabetes. You can get high cholesterol. You can get osteoporosis, you no sex drive, like depressed. So now you're going to be given an antidepressant, a statin, insulin. So yeah. that, that's the trade-off, right? You're, kind of choo- you're going to choose a medication that's exactly the same as what your body produces and give back to, what the bo- to your body what it needs. Or you're going to go on all these other medications because they'll save your life. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally hear what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's a tough thing. It's a tough thing for people to wrap their head around. But like I said before, this is we're in a new era. We're living longer than ever before. So we got to work with that. We got to say, okay, what, what kills us? And we know, like, we all start dying when we lose our hormones. All this is what, like, as we age and we lose these hormones... All of these things start happening, dementia, cancer, heart disease. And we know that hormones run a lot of those things, the loss of them. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious in a more practical sense for people that are in those stages of life or have had conversations with doctors, what are some red flags that doctors might say, your average doctor, that you think people should be aware of so that women know yeah. they're not alone, there is other answers available? Like what is the most common kind of rhetoric in the doctor's office for mm-hmm. people to hear that really isn't the whole truth or the, you know, that maybe they're just not as informed in the right way? That hormones will kill them, that their hormones will give them breast cancer. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, oh, let's put you on birth control pill. You can't, I can't tell you how often perimenopausal women, even menopause, I've met menopausal women in their sixties that were put on birth control pills because of, for their symptoms. Mm -hmm. So if a doctor says, I'll give you birth control pills to control your symptoms, that's a huge red flag. Hysterectomy also, like there's other things that you can explore first before jumping to a hysterectomy. Sometimes a hysterectomy is necessary, but you also want to look at what else can be done. And then same with like all of the slew of medications that I was just talking about. Like that's what they're trained to do. You go to your doctor because you're depressed because you're, you know, you've hit perimenopause and suddenly you've, you've got anxiety and depression for the first time in your life. Guess what the doctor's going to give you? An antidepressant. Mm. They're not going to say, oh, well, maybe it's because you're losing your hormones. So I, I really don't think that doctors are the people to see for hormones, to be honest, it, nor an endocrinologist. They're not trained in this. So you have to arm yourself with the right information. And then maybe you could go to your doctor and say, this is what I want. Advocate for yourself and say, I want to try hormones. And this is the kind of hormones I want to try. And if they say no, I'll give you birth control pill or an antidepressant. Then you know that you got to find a different practitioner to work with. Um, but don't expect them to know and don't get angry when they can't help you because they're not trained in it. Yeah. You know who is trained in it? Karen Martell. <laughs> so for anybody listening that does need your support, where can everybody find you and your stuff and your programs and your support? Okay. So I kind of have something for everybody, which is nice because I know that, <clears throat> you know, affordability does, you know, make a difference for a lot of people out there. And they say, Oh, but well, I need help and I can't afford to go and pay for it. So I actually do have a great group coaching program. That's very affordable. Um, it's been going for over five years now. We've always got a great 
great group of women in there. And I teach you all of these things that we've talked about today. I take you through every step of this, like the detoxification, the hormone replacement therapy, the supplements, the diet, all of this. And there's weekly group coaching calls. So we can meet together. I'll do lab reviews, give recommendations that they can take to their doctor. Um, so that's, that's awesome. I love it. Um, it's my favorite thing actually. And I've got a podcast the other side of weight loss, which is going to change the name soon, but I don't know what that's going to be yet. That's Maddie's a, trying to help me with yeah, that. Yeah, it's going to be exciting. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this rebranding. Yeah. So if any of you have a name for me, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> we were just going to, yesterday we came up with just Karen hormones, which I thought was really funny. <laughs> yes. just, just Karen hormones. <laughs> Karen hormones. Yeah. You can just totally rebrand yourself. <laughs> Change your name. Uh, and then, the, yeah. And then I also have um, private coaching programs, one on one. And then we also work with a team of doctors in the United States who can prescribe in every state um, who, do, who will um, do the hormone replacement therapy because I'm not a doctor. I can't prescribe, but we've got doctors on our team. And then um, we can also prescribe in Alberta and British Columbia and Canada, unfortunately, not in Australia. Yeah, but people can still get loads of good advice and direction. Yeah, we have Australians in our group. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, for sure. Amazing, amazing. Well, I'm so glad you came back to hang out. Um, And yeah, I think this conversation, well, it's going to be increasingly important because as we know with most uh, health struggles and challenges, these things seem to be getting worse because of the level of toxic that our world is becoming more of every single day. So Um, I think a lot of people are going to be turning to people like you, Karen, uh, you know, in the future, more so than they need right now, because, yeah, it's just going to get more and more complicated and confusing and toxic and all of the things that it is. So thanks for being here and sharing that. So before you go, though, um, I've got one more question for you. Uh, What is one piece of health information that you wish more people knew about? Everything we just talked about. (laughs) (laughs) That no, that you don't have to suffer. I think that that in perimenopause, yeah, that that, you, that does not have to be a thing. So don't ever be told that you have to just suck this up and get through it. No, that's not the case. There's so much that you can do, and no woman has to suffer or man. Amazing, thank you. And if you've been enjoying this episode and you feel like somebody you know is going to benefit, please. Give it to uh, a family member, a friend, anybody that you think is going to benefit from this conversation and Karen's fantastic work. All of Karen's links and bits and pieces are going to be down in the show notes below. Karen, thanks for being here. Thanks for hanging out. Maddie, thanks for having me. You are so welcome. We'll catch you really soon. (laughs) 